This quiet yet determined composer ruled the genre that defined American music at the turn of the 20th century and linked African American music from plantation songs to jazz. I'm the Classical Nerd and today we're talking about Scott Joplin. We don't exactly know when or where Scott Joplin was born, but it was most likely at some point around 1868. We don't know this information largely because, in the post-Civil War South, records of newly free families were almost non-existent on a state level. It's only the 1870 census data, the taking of which was a federal operation, which allows us to know that young Scott was two in June of that year. The Joplins made their home in eastern Texas, and the political and socioeconomic situation for African Americans at that point was pretty bad. Texas had to draft not just one, but two new state constitutions in order to be readmitted to the Union, and the provisions that it eventually provided for formerly enslaved people were never really super strongly enforced. While slavery had been officially abolished at the federal level except as a punishment by the 13th Amendment, the actual enforcement of this federal legislation on the practical level came down to the Freedmen's Bureau, which was only ever present in major metropolitan areas. As a result, with racist resentment at an all-time high, former slaves were still functionally slaves as a system of serfdom immediately replaced chattel slavery. The Joplins, understandably scared of all the lynchings that were going on in the area and seeking further upward mobility, well, they just left. By 1880, Scott's father Giles had moved the family to Texarkana, on the Texas side, technically, as far as we know. And this town had sprung into existence, willed into existence, even, by the very railroad that Giles was now working for. Again, we don't really know the real dates. The only evidence we have of this is the census in 1880 shows them living in Texarkana on the Texas side. The situation in the border town was a lot better, despite the Texas legislature not enforcing the educational provisions that it had provided for in its constitution. But there was this enormous interest among former slaves to get themselves, and especially their children, an education. They knew that this was the key to unlocking whatever greater future that the next generation could have. When it was clear that the state wasn't interested in helping them, the community organized education itself on its own terms. This included music. Giles Joplin played the violin, and Florence Joplin, Scott's mother, played the banjo and sang. Scott inherited the traditions of plantation songs and church music while becoming a really good banjo player in his own right, like he was shredding by the age of seven. He was good enough to attract a lot of attention in the local community, such that he actually got music lessons for either free or something close to it. They didn't have a lot of money to spare. One of his early music teachers seems to have been a German immigrant named Julius Weiss who perhaps sympathized a little bit with Joplin's plight because of the rabid anti-Semitic attitudes that were happening in his homeland. While Florence was very supportive of her son's interest, Giles was a little more practical, and he did not support his son's musical career, mostly because he looked at the complete lack of black musicians and talent out there, and he realized that this was not going to be a good career for his son. Like, he didn't think he could make it. Although there is scant evidence to support this theory, some have been given to speculate that this rift is is what caused Giles to ultimately leave Florence in the early 1880s and live across town with a woman named Laura. Florence was then put in an impossible position of trying to feed five mouths on a maid's budget, so she moved the family to cheaper housing and did everything she could to try to make ends meet. She got permission from the owner of one of the houses she cleaned to let Scott play the piano. This is where things really took off for him. He proved to have an incredible memory for music. He could remember things almost photographically years after he'd first heard them. He had perfect pitch in addition to working out the scales and the exercises that he had been given. He also was trying to sight read some of this family sheet music. Despite their overall poor status, Florence invested in a secondhand piano for her son so that he could play at home. And it's likely she got some support from the community for this. While Giles may have been very pessimistic about his son's prospects, it wasn't like the black community in Texarkana was lacking for any places to show off. There were myriad social gatherings and events for which Joplin would improvise or play one of his early pieces. As Joplin came into his own, it was clear that he was not about to settle for the dead-end prospects of being a second-class citizen in Texarkana. All roads led out. He wanted to pursue a career on his own terms, and he was also no fan of manual labor. 
and he inherited especially from his mother a deep and abiding belief in the value of education. So there was really no place to go but out. And again, it's frustrating for biographers to have such a historically important figure who lived relatively recently compared to some of the other composers whose biographies I have on the shelf here. And yet the historical record is so lacking that for huge and really important periods in his development, in his career, we just don't know where he is. Piecing the timeline together feels like doing quantum mechanics. It doesn't help here because Joplin spent several years on the road and he toured around. He lived the life of an itinerant pianist. There was this whole underclass of peripatetic musicians who traveled around by any means they could get to anywhere that needed a spare pianist. Mostly this would involve playing in bars and saloons and brothels. Brothels always needed pianists. While these itinerant musicians were all going for the same jobs, they realized that they were all in it together and that the success of one meant the success of the rest of them because they needed to keep you know, the market alive for their services. And even though this class comprised musicians of all skin colors and ethnicities, uh, they were mostly black. So the collective idiom that emerged from these roots has its origins in the black musical tradition. This ultimately led to the development of ragtime, but Again, from a musicological perspective, it is really frustrating not to have a notated lineage for this. You can't see it evolve over time. It just comes into existence one day if you're just looking at the sheet music. When really notated ragtime was something that came after ragtime as it was actually being played. We can only really analyze them from an ethnomusicological perspective where various aspects of rags can be compared and contrasted to what we know of surviving bits of plantation music. Rhythm is hugely important in ragtime, not just because ultimately it goes back to African musical traditions, which largely, and again, I don't want to generalize, but for the sake of a short video like this, I kind of have to, uh, really based around rhythm more so than a lot of other musical traditions. And this became a code in plantation songs rhythm could be used by slaves to communicate across large distances in a way that the owners couldn't interpret. It was a way of communication. So rhythm held a hugely important place in the musical languages of the collective black culture of the United States as it existed at that time. But what exactly is a rag? When it coalesced, like what was a rag and what defined that genre? There are plenty of particular features of the rag that account for its very brief but very intense popularity in Joplin's heyday. The first is a presence of a stride bass with low notes or octaves jumping up to middle register or sort of high bass clef chords in this oompa rhythm. Second, you always have syncopation in the right hand. Strong, emphasized, and longer note values come at unusual places within the metric structure, giving the music a heightened sense of propulsion, and it often also makes it catchy. Formally, you start with a four-bar introduction, and then you proceeded to follow that up with various 16-measure segments known as strains, and these strains would then be repeated for full 32-bar sections. So the A strain would be repeated twice for an A, A section. Then it would be a B strain, B, B, each 16 bars, adding up to 32 bars. And this is where you would occasionally see, and you could have a recapitulation of the A strain, but you wouldn't have the full recapitulation of A, A, you would just have the 16 bars, so it would just be A. And then you would have a trio section, C, C, D, D, organized along the same lines. Of course, you could play with the structure a little bit, and Joplin certainly did by the time that it became the settled rag form. But in a lot of ways, this mold, because it was more commercialized, uh, was truly a mold into which material was then poured, as opposed to a lot of other ways we conceive of forms from the classical era now. Uh, composers of the classical era did not think of sonata form as sonata form, and nowadays composers do try to fill that mold. With ragtime and a lot of other forms that were, achieved popular success, there was a formula to it because you had to, to just really crank these things out. This is not a diminishment of the rag as a genre in any sense. I mean, but where do you think pop music gets its repetitive structures and appeal from? It's the same principle. People know what works and they know what will sell. And if you hit upon a formula that really works that 
also open enough such that composers can still be creative within it to make things that are catchy, then it really does work as a genre. Also, the form of the strains took on a call and response uh, type of setup, uh, which is often common to various spirituals. There's also a cultural element to the rag, which is tied in with the give and take of the minstrel tradition. Minstrelsy took off in popularity with white people in the decades leading up to the Civil War. The 1850s especially was the real rise of a minstrel tradition. While black minstrels actually existed before this, it was really when white people took on minstrelsy, which included blackface and a general parodying of what they felt to be stereotypical black life, they made it its own thing, and that increased its popularity because, well, just by dint of their higher social status when black people were still enslaved. This affected itinerant musicians like Joplin, who was in his late teens and early 20s at this point, and he was faced with audiences who expected these traditions, whose expectations of his music were informed by racist minstrel caricatures. They were so accustomed to these parodies of black life, which often romanticized slavery, that they expected similar stuff out of someone like Joplin. You can kind of see ragtime as a reclamation of a cultural slur, taking back something that white culture had appropriated in order to make fun of them. Another example of this appropriation, in a slightly smaller context, is the cakewalk. This was a black parody of the uppity white two-step, but the cakewalk was then reappropriated by white people, and it was just this kind of fun little dance. It's telling that the two most famous examples of cakewalks that I can think of in the established classical literature are by Percy Granger and Claude Debussy. In any event, by 1893, the word ragtime was common enough in usage to be in publication now. The first rags were actually being published. Ragtime was now a word. At this point, Joplin seems to have settled in St. Louis, Missouri, although he didn't seem to consider himself a resident of St. Louis, Missouri, because he still traveled around a lot. St. Louis was just his home base. It helped that in bigger cities, race relations were generally better than they were in rural areas. It's actually impossible to even pin him down there because he wasn't ever listed in the city directory. <laughs> Does he have to make it this difficult for us? Saloons and brothels were where he found himself working most often, and this was anathema to his nature as a really quiet and reserved dude. This is just where he happened to find work. Yet despite his noted improvisational abilities, Joplin bristled at the idea of becoming a composer, of writing down his works, notating them such that they could be published. He was afraid of failure, and he didn't think that there was a big market for it. Like his father, Joplin was deeply wary of anything that he felt wasn't going to work. If you were trying to make a name, not just for yourself, but be a representative of your race in an overall still very racist society, you needed to be a model citizen. And if you failed in publicizing your works, or publishing them even, then that didn't just reflect on you, it reflected on your whole culture. So he was very reticent to take these risks. But 1893 was a turning point. Rags were beginning to attain a kind of respectability that they theretofore hadn't had. And this is in part because of the World's Fair that occurred in Chicago of that year. Almost 30 million people attended this gathering, and even though itinerant musicians were relegated to the fringes, their music was still popular enough that this event boosted Ragtime's popularity enormously. Joplin's experiences in Chicago leading a band and the world-class black talent he saw convinced him that there was indeed a market and a sort of reason for publishing his works. But in order to be published, you had to play the game. Publishing was a commercial business. You had to convince a publisher that your music was going to sell. Otherwise, it was not worth the price of having it engraved, which was a very time-consuming process back then. Non-established composers were often stuck on the outside trying to break in. And this was true for composers of any ethnicity, but especially true when you considered the fact he was black in that era. Joplin's first published works actually come from 1895, 
and they were published in Syracuse, New York. His musical life in performance was a part of the Texas Medley Quartet, a quartet that existed in various forms over the years and actually was rarely a quartet. It included anywhere from four to eight members at any given time. By 1896, Joplin's publications had gone into instrumental music, ballads and marches, and the following year the Medley Quartet disbanded and Joplin settled down a more reasonable and permanent existence in Sedalia, Missouri. Sedalia served as a Union Army post during the Civil War, and the racism wasn't nearly as bad there as it was in St. Louis, let alone more rural areas. There was a lot of work to be found on the outskirts, and the black community had access to the George R. Smith College, run by the Methodist Church and active from 1894 to 1925 when it burned down. 1897 was also the year that the first rag was published by William Krell, a white Chicagoan, which unleashed a torrent of rags upon the nation. The existing tradition, mind you, was just now getting notated. Joplin knew that his notation ability, which was never that great, was lackluster, and he didn't really know how best to notate the advanced rhythms and the syncopations, really, of the rags that he was playing. So he pursued further study in Sedalia. Some sources indicate that he did study this, study music at the George R. Smith College, but it is doubtful that an institution, even though it was nationally renowned, uh, it wasn't that big, so it's doubtful that they had a really extensive music program. So he probably studied privately with professors who also taught there. Soon, though, he had the Maple Leaf Rag written down, and he began showing it to publishers. And while publishers initially rejected it, it became very popular in Sedalia. It's possible that the Maple Leaf Club was named for it, but it's equally likely that the composition took its name from the club. It's unusual that publishers would be uninterested in this piece when his composition, Original Rags, was already out there in published form by 1899. Eventually, Joplin played the Maple Leaf Rag for John Stark, who published it. Joplin signed an exclusive five-year contract with Stark, where the only money he was promised was one cent per copy. A risky financial move indeed, but Joplin was anxious to have a solid working relationship with a publisher and really lock that down. The Maple Leaf Rag in its first year made him all of $4 in royalties, which is about $125 in today's money, but you know, still far from enough to live on. What Joplin appreciated about the Stark Enterprise is that their covers weren't exploitative. That is, they didn't put anything that people would consider racist by any sort of modern standard on the cover as a ploy to get people interested in it. Doing so was, unfortunately, very common practice for black composers who had their music on the shelves. You see, ragtime was sweeping the nation, but publishers were afraid of putting it on the shelves because they still were not convinced that it would sell all that well because it still had negative connotations. I mean, this was the kind of music they played in saloons and brothels, and oftentimes there'd be bawdy words put to it, even if they weren't original. These negative associations deeply concerned Joplin, because he believed that the rag could stand alongside any other established musical form and tradition. It could be respectable music, it just hadn't been given the chance to be that. Joplin's immense celebrity in Sedalia, where he organized and won pretty regularly ragtime playing contests where two contestants would go back and forth playing variations on strains until one of them could not one-up the other one, he, that fame did not really translate outside of Sedalia. He was just a local celebrity at best. But Joplin, as ever, remained undaunted and wrote a ragtime folk ballet called The Ragtime Dance, and in 1899 started the Scott Joplin Drama Company. He then rented Sedalia's opera house, and he staged the ragtime dance for one evening, which is all the budget would allow. Stark was there, but he didn't bite on a publication since the Maple Leaf Rag was off to a slow start. Its popularity would soon skyrocket in fall 1900, primarily off of word of mouth, of pianists who had gone to Sedalia, learned about Joplin, learned about ragtime, and then went back to other places. The most interesting of these stories concerns a pianist named Samuel Brunson Campbell, Remember that name? Something really cool happens in 1930. Anyway, when he left to go back to his family in Kansas, Joplin gave him a half dollar, uh, which was engraved with the date of his first published rag as a kind of a good luck charm. Joplin's music was now selling so well that Stark and his son moved out of Sedalia to St. Louis to invest in their printing operation. The most of their money came off of the back of Joplin's rags. Joplin was initially set on honoring the terms of their initial five-year agreement, but he was privately peeved at how Stark had treated him over denying publishing the ragtime dance. 
So what he would do is sometimes he would take a piece, then he would sell it to another publisher, sometimes under the condition that it not be published until 1904. Additionally, in 1901, he self-published a piece called The Easy Winners. And you can see this as kind of a warning shot to Stark and to assert his own independence. Eventually, perhaps in part due to guilt over how well the Maple Leaf Rag was selling and not wanting to lose his biggest name to another rival publisher, Stark finally published the Ragtime Dance. Joplin's lucky break of sudden popularity for the Maple Leaf Rag was aided in part by a German-born musician, the director of the St. Louis Choral Symphony Society, one Alfred Ernst. He introduced Joplin's music to Europeans, and he intended, according to a February 1901 edition of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, to take Joplin with him to Europe. And this didn't materialize for a lot of reasons, mostly monetary ones, but it's cool to think of what might have happened if that happened. Ernst had previously brought the music of Samuel Coleridge Taylor to the Midwest, and he was largely a proponent of racial equality, which disheartened him because St. Louis was still pretty segregated and there wasn't much he could do to stop that. Ernst and Joplin would stay in touch for a long time after that, and Joplin would learn elements of the classical tradition, including counterpoint, from him. But soon enough, Joplin began to fall victim to the vast and fast stylistic changes that were going on underneath him in ragtime. The rug was being pulled out from underneath him as the next generation of composers and performers were changing what rag was and what rag meant. While a lot of rags today are played at least moderately fast, Joplin was very clear in all of his rags, well, almost all of them, to write something like not fast or moderately. The idea was that a rag was not supposed to be showy in terms of technique, although it easily could be because if you speed up the tempos, the pieces still work, the stride bass becomes super virtuosic, and the rollicking syncopated rhythms really rock. He may note that while he considered the rag to be a stable new invention that would take its place alongside all these other forms, he didn't consider this new rag style to be rags in the slightest. Real ragtime to Joplin was difficult to play and to pull off properly, not in terms of pure technique and how fast you could go, but by interpretation. And to that end, Joplin published kind of a school of how to play ragtime, and this was published as the School of Ragtime. It was a manual, if you will, on the art of playing a rag. But this fast style was what other rag performers of the early 1900s were playing. Remember, only the rarefied few got their rags published, and now in St. Louis, Joplin relied more on his status as a composer than that of a performer. These ragtime playoffs, which he would consistently win in Sedalia, in part due to a significant home field advantage, these he lost in the few occasions that he would engage in them in other places. Even though he was still respected in the rag world, his style of playing was considered old-fashioned, and people didn't enjoy it as much. The performing tradition had certainly evolved away, but Joplin was still considered the king of the published rag. It did affect him, though. He was reserved, and he really didn't like being shown up. So after a while, he just stopped playing in public at all, except when he was invited to in very particular circumstances where it wasn't a competition. Even though the greatest performers of that next generation in the new style, your, your Jelly Roll Mortons, for instance, owed a huge amount to Joplin and said so. With performances on the rag battle circuit almost non-existent, Joplin turned all his energy towards showing how rags could be a refined form of composition. To back this up, when he did perform, he only performed his pieces, and he only performed these pieces as they were notated. But opera was his next goal. He was always thinking about the next big project and the next thing that could further legitimize not just himself, but his genre in the eyes of the wider culture. This came in the form of a guest of honor, a one-act, 12-number affair based on the invitation that President Theodore Roosevelt extended to Booker T. Washington to have dinner at the White House. But the practical and financially conservative Stark was surely not interested in allowing Joplin to publish simply whatever he wanted, convinced that there would be no way to recoup the losses of such a massive publication. Interestingly, this was not the first opera by a black composer. That happened about a decade earlier, when Harry Lawrence Freeman had several operas produced out in Denver. While Stark was impressed with the private performance of the opera that he saw, he pointed to the low sales for the ragtime dance, and uh, well, you can imagine an I told you so moment. But Joplin still knew how to remind Stark that he was more than happy to go outside of his services. Stark needed Joplin far more than Joplin needed Stark. There was some upheaval in his personal life as well in 1903. 
He threw himself into writing more pieces, and this coincided with the birth of his daughter, but his relationship with his wife, Belle, was absolutely atrocious. J Joplin really required a partner who believed in his music and was interested in it, and was, would also give him the space to work on it that he needed, and Belle would not give him any of those things. She didn't understand it, she didn't want to understand it, uh, it was just not a happy scene. And when their daughter died very suddenly, very soon in infancy, that was basically the end of their relationship as well. Newly single, Joplin took a guest of honor on the road, but that tour collapsed pretty much as soon as it started. He wasn't his usual super productive self until he remarried, this time to 19-year-old Freddie Alexander, who died of pneumonia a couple months into their marriage. He would eventually re-remarry, this time to 33-year-old Lottie Stokes, and this proved to be the one that lasted. She gave him the encouragement and space that he needed, which Bell did not give him, and, well, or Freddie didn't have a chance to. With a new operatic project brewing, Joplin abandoned the idea of a ragtime opera and instead focused on that of a folk opera. So a guest of honor went out the door and he now focused on his big project, the one that he felt could possibly cement his legacy, the opera Trimanisha. He feverishly composed this when sheet music sales went down and he was forced to tour to make a living. This opera has wider historical importance than anyone gave it credit for being for a long, long time. The plot is almost a point-for-point -point inversion of the German romantic opera Der Freischutz by Karl Maria von Weber, placing it well within the European tradition while balanced with plot devices and music that spoke to the folk tales that Joplin grew up learning as well. Sometimes Trimonesia is unfortunately still called a ragtime opera, but this simply isn't accurate. It pulls from all sorts of musical traditions that Joplin knew of in his early life. The story is pretty basic. It highlights a backwards and superstitious culture that ultimately learns the value of education, something that you can see parallels to what he believed because it's what his mother believed. His mother was less superstitious than his father, largely because she was born free, and so she had some access to education and didn't have uh, the kinds of superstitions that a lot of black culture had because, again, you had enslaved people who were systematically denied access to, like, even learning how to read. So in Trimonesia, he's making a political statement. He's making a statement on the nature of what black people needed to do, but the timing impacts the meaning. Was he saying that this is what happened and they, there was an emergence into this new light of, you know, reason and education, or was he saying that this still needed to happen? Oh, and also he choreographed the whole thing. His admiration for Richard Wagner is something that we learn about only from Alfred Ernst. Uh, so it's possible that Ernst made up or otherwise exaggerated that for a white audience who perceived opera at the top of a pecking order of types of music, with Wagner at the very tip top of that. But the fact that Joplin conceived of his entire approach from libretto to drama to choreography speaks to a somewhat Wagnerian understanding of a total work of art. Looking at the timeline, though, it's possible, in fact, it's most likely that Ernst himself is the one who introduced Joplin to Wagner's music. Ernst was such a big and noted Wagner interpreter and fan that he was on the shortlist to direct the Bayreuth Festival in 1903. The reason we know that Joplin was not aware of Wagner before this is Largely because, I mean, where are you going to see the ring cycle being done in a provincial opera house? No, they were doing earlier romantic works, mostly, so he would have been more familiar with the sound and the story structure of the early German romantics than the later ones, because of the performing forces involved. To say that Joplin's inherent musical language was Wagnerian is, is just not accurate. The Trimonesia full score is unfortunately missing, so the job of orchestrating it has come down to other composers, most notably Gunther Schuller who did so for the Houston Grand Opera premiere of the piece in 1975. Schuller was very aware of the feeling that Joplin was going for, a period charm, he said, that harkened back to the pit orchestras that he would have known. So here you have a black composer stereotyped for writing in one hyper-specific genre that is pretty far removed from opera. You have an operatic world that is very reticent to add anything new to its repertoire. And thirdly, you have a missing full score, so you don't actually have Joplin's original orchestration. These problems compound, and for that reason, Trimonesia has never made a place in the repertoire. 
in favor of, say, Porgy and Bess, which of course is written by Gershwin, and it has its own problems with portraying stereotypes about black life, and there's, there's a whole story behind that. Go watch my video on Gershwin if you're interested. Nevertheless, Joplin won the Pulitzer Prize in 1976, the year after the Houston Grand Opera premiered the piece, and this was actually not taken all that well by a lot of Joplin enthusiasts, and a lot of people who were trying to promote black music. And the idea was that, hey, if you're going to give the Pulitzer Prize to a black composer, why not you give it to someone who's working in jazz, working in improvisation, working in something that's a little bit more relevant to the then socio-political climate of the mid-1970s? Why do you have to give it posthumously to Scott Joplin, of all people? Plus, there's also the fact that the Pulitzer Prize in music is not really considered to be all that important within the field. Like, it's nice to be nominated, and it's certainly nice to get it, uh, but it doesn't make or break a composer in the musical realm like it does for maybe some other fields. The point is, it's a high honor, but there's an argument to be made that Joplin was like the most conservative black composer they could have possibly given it to. And it's an interesting take, it is worth mentioning here. But at the time, the self-published score attracted no attention. Uh, only one review, which was itself uh, pretty glowing, but this didn't help. He needed to get this thing produced, and there was no real lead to do this. I don't think people really knew how to classify it, because it was not a ragtime opera. It drew from a larger swath of black music that white America really wasn't super familiar with. This is the same tradition that inspired Antonin Dvorak's American works, but Joplin was ultimately old news. Ragtime had already grown in a different direction, and Joplin was so fervently against the new style that he refused to change what he felt to be his expression of an authentic ragtime. He was determined to make it as a capital C composer, if you will, and because of that he sought respectability. Not long after poor John Stark had to move back out of New York, he'd moved there because his business was booming, and sales dropped off. People weren't as interested, he had to move back to Missouri. But around that same time, the Joplins moved there because he believed that he needed to go all in on getting Tremonesia produced. In fall 1913, it appeared that Tremonesia would finally be premiered. There was a theater in Harlem that was interested, but then there was a change of ownership, and then they flaked on the plans. So back to square one. But by 1915, it seemed like it was finally going to get its premiere. And Joplin went all in on this. The budget was really small. No instruments except Joplin himself on the piano. No budget for costumes. One night only. And this was his big break. He thought. He hoped against hope that the music would carry the production, but it didn't. The audience was not interested in what Joplin had to say. And it wasn't an issue of racism either. The black folks in Harlem were really uncomfortable with presenting a superstitious past on the operatic stage. They didn't feel like it was a good move. This hurt Joplin more deeply than perhaps anything else could, just to sink so much of your time and your life and your effort to, to move across the country in the early 19-teens to pursue this dream, finally after years of trying to get it produced, actually getting it produced on the most shoestring budget and have it completely fall on its face. Not just it wasn't just poorly reviewed, I mean, it wasn't reviewed at all. That, somehow, that's even worse. Joplin was stuck because he didn't want to keep writing commercial music, but there was no market for his commercial music either. Especially when Tin Pan Alley got a hold of this rhythmic style that he didn't like, it was pretty much over for the old style of rags. And this got him into some serious career trouble. Like, where did he go from there? Serious art music was one where black composers had a notoriously difficult time. Going back to even Mozart's arrival, the Frenchman Joseph Bologna, who has long been passed over, you have the British Samuel Coleridge Taylor, who faced racism in symphony orchestras and was nicknamed the African Mahler, which is its own problematic can of worms. You also had African-American composers like Harry Burley and James Tim Brim and Willa Marion Cook, who, despite assistance by Dvorak when he began a career directing the National Conservatory of Music in 1892, more often than not ran into difficulties with their careers, because even if these composers found success, and many of them did, at least to some extent, it was seemingly impossible for them to progress beyond whatever specialization they found themselves in. At best, they could be a first-rate, second-rate composer. Additionally, Joplin found himself not just trying to defend the old style of ragtime, but trying to defend ragtime as a whole, because there were these vulgar and nasty words that would be put to these melodies, and he felt like that 
this was just ruining Ragtime's reputation. Any chance of it actually getting a foothold and achieving the kind of fame and broad popularity and legitimacy that he sought for the genre was being totally undermined. He pointed to definitive proof that Ragtime did have a future by looking at overseas sales. Ragtime was booming in other countries, but without international copyright, he wasn't seeing a cent from those royalties. Towards the end of his life, Joplin experimented with rags that went beyond the traditional rag form, basically showing composers of rags how rags should have developed in a more serious vein than the flashy stuff that it had become. So these involved, you know, he didn't rely on the umpa bass as much, he abandoned metric regularity, he would notate it in different rhythms and meters, and generally it was still recognizable as a rag, but it's very advanced in that he's not always sticking to the very things that I mentioned earlier that made a rag a rag. It's actually quite brilliant. His last rag from 1914 is called the Magnetic Rag, and this is as tied into the European tradition as is possible. It's cast in 4-4 and not in 2-4, uses a more cyclical classical form and Italian tempo markings. So why would Joplin do this? You could interpret it as him feeling like he had to bow to Western practices to possibly gain acceptance as a classical composer groveling at the feet of the tradition. But consider that this was something that was self-published. He was able to do exactly what he wanted to do in the Magnetic Rag, and there was nothing anyone could do to stop him. The only person that could stop him turned out actually to be himself and his own mind. We'll get to that in a second. While some critics disliked the Magnetic Rag and pointed to it as evidence that Joplin was mentally losing it, others realized that this was Joplin's knowing swan song, his vision of an unrealized future of ragtime. 
After the failure of Trimanesia depleted their meager savings, Joplin began experiencing the symptoms associated with tertiary syphilis, namely severe dementia. He had difficulty writing, remembering, speaking, and uh, let alone composing. And he feverishly worked on projects, big, ambitious works, like an unrealized first symphony in the moments of lucidity he still had left to him. He knew that time was running out, but he just never had enough time. 1916 was a perilous slide to the end, and by 1917, in February of that year, he had to be hospitalized. He was so weak that he couldn't get up from the bed, and he was so delirious that he couldn't recognize even his closest friends. While the first treatments for syphilis had come about six years earlier, it was too late to save Joplin. And on April 1st, 1917, he died at the age of probably 48 or thereabouts. Again, we don't know when he was born. This marked the final end of the rag era, as jazz had pretty much subsumed it. The Joplins were hardly a close-knit family, and so it took news of his death a long time to travel to various members of his family, and a lot of them had little to no interest in carrying on his tradition, the musical flame. By the end, people really weren't interested in Joplin's rags as much anymore. And the only person who was really trying to promote his works was his widow, Lottie. And it became her duty, her goal in life, to see Tremanisha performed in full version, full costume and orchestra and everything like that, and achieve the success that she knew her late husband always wanted it to have. But getting an opera produced is very difficult, and Joplin's role as the guy who did ragtime well, that was completely subsumed because ragtime itself was subsumed. Nobody was interested in it, save for just a handful of former pupils and students, kind of as a historical oddity more than anything else. Jazz was the big new thing. Her efforts were joined in 1930 by, you guessed it, I told you to remember this name, Samuel Brunson Campbell, who in 1930, he found himself out in, well, I should back up a little bit, that half dollar that Joplin gave him, uh, he ended up messing around with it with a friend and he shot it? Like, okay, like your, your friend and mentor gave you something that was like a keepsake and you shot it. But anyway, the result of this is that right in the middle of the half dollar was an unmistakable dent. And then later on, it must have got mixed up in his pocket and he accidentally spent it. Well, now in 1930, he's running a shop out in California. All of a sudden, somebody pays for their stuff using a dented half dollar. Same year, same everything. And he thinks of this as a sign, so he joins Lottie and he basically realizes that he could use his powers as a pianist to, at that point, recording technology was just in its infancy, so he was gonna record Joplin's music and he was just trying to build more awareness of him. And the point there was to put a marker on Joplin's grave, which was unmarked. And this ended up not going through to fruition, not because Campbell didn't succeed in actually popularizing Joplin's music and doing what he said he was going to do. Rather, the funds that were going to go towards Joplin's memorial actually went just to Lottie because she was suffering from some long illnesses and she had bills she needed to pay. Eventually his grave was marked, but it was like in the 1970s. Up until the 1960s, a good chunk of Joplin's unpublished pieces show up in court records, so we know they existed, but they haven't really shown up since then. So there could be some that are just floating out there in some vault, but we just don't know. Joplin, like most composers who achieve popular success, did so on the back of one thing, and he's been pigeonholed like this, and heck, even the title of this video kind of leans into that in a way that some people might consider problematic. But really, you cannot tell the story of Ragtime without telling the story of Scott Joplin. They are truly intertwined in the same way that you can't talk about Haydn without talking about the high classical era. You can't talk about jazz and the development of different subgenres without talking about someone like Duke Ellington or Miles Davis. And you can talk about like stochasticism without talking about Zanakis. Like, these are characters who are very tied into these particular genres and subsets of this great musical tradition that we call our own. Other composers who tried their hand at ragtime, like Igor Stravinsky, well, they just don't capture the fun essence of the genre. And rags written by more contemporary composers don't capture the spirit of the original ragtime because they incorporate more complex textures and harmonic languages. Overall, they're more virtuosic, even if their tempos more approximate what Joplin would have known. 
so a rag by a more contemporary composer like a William Bolcom would never be mistaken for a Joplin piece. Ragtime still had its enthusiasts, sort of like how disco still had its fans even after the disco era ended. And this bubbled up in various articles and publications that came about after World War II. This culminated in Joplin's music being used for the film The Sting in 1974, which won the Oscars for Best Picture and Score. While ragtime as a genre never took off again in a meaningful way in the cultural zeitgeist, its historical significance and the relative obscurity of its music made it ripe for rediscovery in the post-war decades. New recordings were made, books were published, and America began to rediscover a genre it had forgotten and the composers that made it what it was. And none were more influential than Scott Joplin.